everybody, and welcome into another episode of Rising to the Occasion. So happy to have you here with us. We've got a lot to get to, uh, as always, because we're going to talk about the Men's Basketball National Championship, recap that, uh, and then we're also going to get into John Calipari from Kentucky moving schools on us, and we're also going to get into much more, uh, especially kind of diving into football a little bit. That's right, football. It is still a sport, even though it's not around right now too much, um, but it is around a little bit, so we're going to discuss that. Uh, a lot to get to when it comes to the world of sports. Uh, it's it's always so much fun. If you're watching on YouTube, go ahead and hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, comment down below. We'd love to hear from you guys, love to see everything, and also follow us over on social media. You can find us on X, formerly known as Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all of that jazz. So go check us out on there and show us some love. But before we get too far into it, I want to first bring in a sponsor of ours, and that is Big Frig. Big Frig is an amazing sponsor, an amazing product, a product that we swear by. We swear by so much that we have partnered up with them to make sure to get you guys a deal. Big Frig, as always, uh, they, they supported us with giving us some amazing gear. I've got my trusty tumbler with some cold water in it to keep me from getting parched, and it's perfect for it. Uh, I use it all the time. I've got two of them. Use it all the uh, all the time for coffee in the morning. Uh, I bring it to work with me. Uh, I take it on the road. I sit here in the studio and podcast with my Big Frig tumblers. And not only that, but they also make amazing coolers and so much more. Go check them out. Bigfrig.com. That's B-I-G-F-R-I-G.com. It is a top-of-the-line product, a, an amazing product that you don't want to miss out on, but it, it compares with all of the top brand competitors with such a better price tag. On top of that, we've partnered up with them to get you 20% off by using the code RISING220. You use that code and get yourself 20% off. They're already amazing priced products. So what's another 20%? Go check them out. That's B-I-G-F-R-I-G.com and use that code R-I-S-I-N-G-T-O-2-0 for 20% off. It's an amazing deal, amazing product. Uh, like I said, we swear by it. Uh, their, their coolers are amazing for tailgating, for camping, hunting, whatever the case may be. Go check them out, bigfrig.com and use that code RISING220 for 20% off. Huge thanks to Big Frig for sponsoring our show and this episode. But let's go ahead and get into it. Like I said, a lot to talk about in the world of sports. But before we get too far, I want to first bring in my co-host for this evening. We've got Jeremy across town tonight. How you doing, man? Doing pretty good. Had an eventful day at work today, but um, that's besides the point. Obviously, we got a good lineup for you guys tonight. Like you mentioned, we're bringing up the back-to-back champions, UConn and We'll be digging into a little bit, of course, like you, as you mentioned at the top of the show, um, football is still a sport. Um, it, it's not as talked of as it is right now. Uh, of course, it's not the NFL, but we got to look past that. And we're just thankful that we get to watch some type of football, obviously, going into the start of spring and getting into summer. Then um, I know we'll even be mentioning some stuff from the NAIA, but I'm going to, I'm not going to jump to conclusions on everything. So I'm going to cut the chit to Josh and let's get rolling into it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, yeah, just so much uh, to talk about. And first, having to start off with what happened on Monday, uh, and that is the men's basketball national championship between UConn, the UConn Huskies, and the Purdue Boilermakers. Uh, truly an amazing game. We talked about this one and the hype leading into this game. It, it lived up to it, in my my, my opinion. Uh, I think it was a phenomenal game. And like I said, UConn wins by double digits. I just, you know, it's it's hard to bet against them, uh, especially when you talk about the spread and what they can do and how dangerous they are. Uh, that Donovan Klingon guy is a monster. I know, I, I I know, I understand that Zach Eady is a big dude, but they've got big dudes too, and that's that was the fun matchup that I looked at, and I thought this this is going to be the matchup to watch, and obviously it was. And I know I'm not the only one to say it. I know we're not the only show to say it, but it is. It was an amazing matchup. I loved watching it, and it it just went to show. Uh, and I think Donovan Klingon is is much more athletic, and it showed in that. And he was he was aggressive. He got into foul trouble, so he wasn't allowed to be as aggressive. Um, but Zach Eady still dropped a, a good amount of points, uh, and and was able to do his work on on you know down there down in the paint and. The only thing with Zach Eady, and I think the thing that hurts Purdue, is the fact that he's a one-trick pony. He shoots down in the in the paint, and that's pretty much all you're going to get from him when it comes to to 
to scoring. He's either going to be shooting from the paint or dunking it by standing underneath the rim and just dropping it over top. And mm-hmm. so, you know, he's he's a monster. I think he's great. He has improved tremendously, so I don't want to cut him down. But I think that's why Purdue couldn't pull off the win. It was just because Zach Eady really is just that one-trick pony. Um, but then you look at UConn and what they were able to do defensively. Um, they did a very good job defensively. And they had dudes stepping up all over the place when it came to Spencer or uh, Klingon or uh, I'm trying to think of uh, Caravan. Uh, it was an, as another dude that was just stepping up. And it just seems like everyone was pitching in. And they are also much deeper than Purdue was uh, on the bench. And so it just... Overall, and, and, and another thing, too, Purdue was pressing a lot towards the middle, towards the half of the game, you know, and uh, they were pressing a lot, especially when they were down double digits. And UConn found a way to pass the ball around consistently, effectively, and kept the ball moving in ways that spread Purdue out uh, and allowed them to get in there for the, for the scores. And so uh, overall, I thought this was an amazing game. I thought it was a lot of fun. Uh, and, you know, it's just seeing UConn, how dominant they are, uh, to me, I, I don't think the debate stands. I think they are the, the best team, but we'll probably get to that. But, uh, Jeremy, thoughts on the on the matchup between UConn and Purdue? My thoughts on the matchup of the game, it was definitely it was definitely an exciting game, to, to say the least. I knew it was definitely going to be one of those situations where, looking in Purdue, if you were trying to get in a track race against a very fast UConn team, it was going to be tough for – Purdue to try and withstand and keep the score close with UConn. But like if you look at the stat wise, it it shows for what UConn was able to do. I mean, if you look at their stat wise, it was relatively closer than I thought. <clears throat> Excuse me. But looking at like their field goal percentages, I know Purdue was at 44%, then UConn was only at 48%, which is still both on both sides of the ball, relatively decent number. But like the big thing is it was just so dominant for UConn. And that's how that's just how it's been all year for UConn. And as you've mentioned time in and time out, UConn has won these games by double digit points. And of course, obviously that happened on the championship game on Monday and then winning by 15. And I know I even mentioned to you when we were live the other night that defense wins championships. I, I still stand by that, but unfortunately for Purdue, their defense, it was strong, but not strong enough to stop the Huskies and try and win a national championship. But I still give a lot of credit for, for Purdue and what they were able to bring to the table against the Huskies. But it, you can easily tell on UConn for shutting down Zach Eady down below in the paint. I know they were getting him going on his offside for trying to get a simple layup down below in the paint. They were they were on him like stink on you know what, and it just goes I mean, to he, show he you. He still what. scored thirty seven and he didn't have a good game. So <clears throat> exactly, I'm, that's I'm not trying mind. to cut the dude down saying he's a bad player. That's that's no, not what I no, mean. No, no. It's just there's so much hype around him. He's not as good as some of the hype says he is, and that's that's yeah. my only criticism towards Zach Eady. I think he's a, he's a great player. I think he's going to make it in the league. He's he's huge. Um, For sure. But my only thing is he doesn't like I said said before on, on here is that he doesn't bring the excitement, and that's because he doesn't have he he doesn't necessarily have a whole lot of that talent that you would see from a guy like Steph Curry or Trey Young, the way that those guys shoot from outside, uh, or even KD, the way that the way that he can just do everything. Uh, and, and, you know, even when you look at Steph Curry, the way that he can dish dimes and he can go down. It, let's compare him more to a guy that's similar to him in stature in Nikola Jokic. I, okay. I mean, you see what, what Jokic can do. The Joker, he can he can dish a dime all over the court. He can he can dribble. He, he's he's elusive. Um, he can shoot from anywhere. He, he's, he's gotten himself a nice jumper. Uh, and so I think, you know, with, with that, that's true talent where with Zach Eady, he's just a freak of nature. Uh, and, and that's all I see from him. I don't see that talent that you see from those guys. He's still talented. Don't get me wrong. Just not Absolutely. the same level of talent that you would see from the greatest ba- basketball player ever. Uh, you know, he's definitely not there. Um, 100%. He is a great player. Don't want to cut him down. Um, you know, you, you can score 37 points and still lose, uh, you know, and then, Another dude, uh, Newton, for mm-hmm. UConn. Another dude that was stepping up. Uh, he had a, a great game. I just looking overall, I, I just there was 
from the from the beginning of the game all the way through, UConn just kept the edge the entire way through. They had the the uh, the the overall drive to finish it. Uh, an, another thing to me was Zach Eady. He just and, and this has been a, been a criticism nonstop throughout the season, and especially in this postseason tournament, uh, is just the fact that he doesn't get any fouls called on him. But if you so much as breathe on him when he's down in the paint, which was Klingon's problem, you know, he can't mm-hmm. play aggressive uh, at all or else he's going to get fouled. I think he ended the game with four fouls, one away from being fouled out, and they had to keep on pulling him out. That's when Zach Eady got most of his points whenever Klingon was out. And so, uh, yeah, it was just, it, it was an incredible game. I mean, overall, too. Uh, so, did you see the score from last year? You, you remember what that was? It was 74 to 59. And then this year, 75 to 60, one point off on both sides. Wow. 15 points. I never realized that. Winning the national championship by 15 points two years in a row against two great teams. That's that's incredible. Uh, that That is unheard of. That's my one thing I'll One thing I'll mention, uh, let me pull it up. I know I had it on my phone, and so I forgot to put it in my notes. Um, but with... The overall numbers. This is something that was brought up, and it, it was interesting to see, and, and it's something that I've I've brought up many times. Um, man, I knew I. Oh, here it is. Okay, so the men's title game averaged about fourteen point eight two million viewers. Mm-hmm. That's an incredible number, but the women's national championship uh, was around eighteen point eight seven million who watched the game. Uh, and, and this oh. is something that we brought up is that, man, they, they're getting attention. Uh, and, and another thing that we brought up when, whenever we were previewing this national championship game for the men's was that look at when the women set their national championship, 2 p.m. on a Sunday. A lot of people were saying, why isn't this in prime time, prime time right now? And, and guess what? It wasn't in prime time. But what were you doing at 2 p.m. on a, on a Sunday? What, I was. What are what I are most people? Work, yeah, what are well? Yeah, you were because <laughs> you worked yeah, on the weekend. Work. <laughs> what are what are most people, most sports watchers, doing at two p.m. on a Sunday? Um, nothing. You, nothing. You, you got home from church. Uh, you, you might be clicking on to watch some golf. Uh, sit there and relax after after lunch. Or you just finished course. up family lunch. Whatever the case may be, two p.m. on a Sunday, you're pretty free most of the time. That's a mm-hmm. weekend day, and and you don't have too much going on on a Sunday. What are you doing at nine twenty? Because uh, that's what it was nine twenty Eastern time on a Monday. You're probably Usually. winding down and getting ready for bed if you've got to work the yeah. next day. Yeah. So I mean, just I, I, it's it, it's blown out of proportion. Um, but I will, like I mentioned, women's women's basketball was much more exciting this year. As much as Blake hates to hear that, women's basketball was much more exciting this year, and the reason being. First off, Caitlin Clark. She is the first and foremost reason why the attention is being brought to basketball. So uh, something to be brought up on that. All the women that are hating on her, all the the former and current players and the WNBA and the former UConn players, all of that, uh, and, and any college women's players right now that are criticizing Caitlin Clark, uh, you know, trying to cut her down. I got news for you. She is the only reason why you were viewed why you had this many views in the national championship. The only, the, the first and foremost reason is her. Now, because people are drawn in because of Caitlin Clark, we just so happened, we were able to see other great talents like the Cameron Brink and uh, Paige Beckers and, you know, the, the Cordonzo uh, and Juju. So because of Caitlin Clark, we were introduced to, man, look, there's a lot more talent around that we wouldn't have seen if it wasn't for Caitlin Clark. So first and foremost, Caitlin Clark bringing the eyes in. And then after that, uh, just the fact that, you know, looking at, at the scheduling, when they scheduled their game compared to the men's game, people were going to bed by the time, by the time or before the men's game started. So that, that's, that's one thing. I mean, I, that, that irritated me that they, that were doing that on a Monday. Same thing with the national championship for, for college football, like we were talking about. Absolutely. I mean, Kaylin Clark is, like you've obviously said, it's the main reason why they've actually got views this year. I mean, <clears throat> outside of her, I mean, other people talking about Gabby Marshall and Kaylin Reese, or, um, yeah, Reese. A- Angel Reese, me. yeah. Angel Reese, there you go, thank you. Um, <clears throat> they've been the main reasons why just you see more viewers for the women's, of course, and like you obviously mentioned, a really great point. 
you play at 2 p.m. in the middle of the afternoon, I'll watch that game. If it's at night, like, I'll still watch both the men's and women's, which obviously I did. But if I'm watching the men's game, I'm usually in my PJs, just sitting in my recliner, just watching it, hope I don't fall asleep in my chair. I mean, I'm not trying to bash the men's March Madness tournament just because we all love the men's tournament. Don't get me wrong, but... I I'm 100% think... trying to bash them for their scheduling. Yeah, issues. yeah okay. Figure out I mean, how to schedule. I mean, what what do we do on this show? We try to find a, a prime time to schedule our shows most of the time. It doesn't always fall in a prime time position, you know, p- positioning because of the way true. it works out for our schedule. But we, we try that. We understand that on this show. Uh, during college football season, we do our live shows when? Saturday mornings Saturday morning. before the game. We don't start we don't start our show right at right, right at, at noon or 11, 11 yeah. central uh, right whenever the games are starting because nobody wants to watch us whenever the games are on TV. You know, mm-hmm. it's it's a scheduling thing and they knew what they were doing. I don't know why they did it that way. Um, but yeah. you know, it's yeah, it's it's ridiculous. But I mean the uh, only positive thing that you get from the women's to the men's is they actually or other way around, excuse me, they actually know how to put a court together and not mess up the three throw line. <laughs> exactly. Line, excuse me. Yeah, they don't they don't put one three point line further away than the other. Uh, yeah, that's, that's that's one thing. thing. Uh, and uh, you know, I guess obviously, I the the ta- this is this is where where Blake and and I will disagree. And I wish he was on tonight so we could we could kind of discuss it a little more because I was I was taking it easy on him. Uh, what was it Monday when we had our live show? Mm-hmm. Kind of taking it easy on him, teasing him a little bit, but. Uh, you know, the, the thing is, I understand where he's coming from. I'm not going to argue his point that women's basketball is not as exciting as men's. And, and it really isn't. Uh, and there's, it's no cut down. We have a smaller ball for women's for a reason. Why don't we have a shorter hoop or something? Do something. You know, we have the three-point line in for women. We understand that stuff. Why not? And and we'll, we'll talk more about those uh, those differences and stuff like that too here later. Yeah. But uh, yeah, just just ridiculous you know that that we don't do something to, to give it how can you how can you boost them and give them a better chance to to have the excitement that the men have that's that's what I'm thinking um, but let's let's talk about this Yukon team real quick like I said winning two national championships in a row by 15 points and two March Madness tournaments from start to finish right. in a row by finishing by double digits on every single game in two tournaments in a row. You know, obviously, Dan Hur- uh, uh, Dan Hurley, absolute one of the best Legend. ever to do it right now, the way that it stands. He's built the dynasty. Is this two-year team at UConn, in your opinion, is it the best ever? Is that even a question? The only the only way you you can combat it is maybe like that 2007 Florida team who was the last one to win two in a row. I can right. see the comparison, but when you <clears> see <throat> what they were able to do and how they were able to do it, I I, I don't understand how this is such a debate. No, I, I look at this two year team. I think this two year team is the greatest basketball team to well, have ever done it. Uh, they lost guys. And still came back and, and did it. I think Purdue is right up there, you know, not not as being best ever, but they're they're up there for it's like the, what they were able to do because they lost some big time talent. They lost, I think it was three guys on their three starting guys. lineup, and came back in and still dominated up to up to the national championship game. So mm-hmm. you know, but looking at this UConn team, absolutely phenomenal, <laughs> to- totally phenomenal. Uh, and 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 if you say anything other than that, I think you're crazy. Oh, if you say anything otherwise, you're off the deep end. I mean, you can say all you want about UConn, but this is a true definition of where you can talk the talk, but you can walk the walk and show why when it comes to March Madness and college basketball in general, we are the team that you need to circle on your calendar because you if you don't show up, you ain't winning. UConn has completely dominated this entire these last two seasons and obviously it goes to show you why they're back to back champions and obviously it's a no brainer this team in my mind and obviously in your mind as well Josh and Blake's mind if I had to speak for Blake who's not here unfortunately they're the best college basketball team in general as of right now I yeah. I I say I say as of right now because obviously I know the season's over 
and we got some things that could easily change during the off season for people leaving. And well, and, I and you know, I, I'm not I'm not necessarily saying anything about their future. They may come out next year and totally flop, not look like the same team whatsoever. That's what I'm saying. I like, don't think that's going to happen with team. Hurley as their head coach. Um, and, yeah. But they'll you know, still be in the. I, be in the I, I will say, backing up to that 07, I looked it up to pull up their their scores for for you to kind of read this off. They had okay. a, a dominant season in, in 2007 in the in the tournament. They beat Jackson State 112 to 69. That's that's crazy. Um, but then they they won 74 to 67, so by seven points against Purdue. Uh, and then against Butler, they won 65 to 57, so by eight points there. Um, and then. 85 to 77 against Oregon, so another eight point win, uh, and then a you know in the let's see, oops, got got something popped up on my. Josh, got, from the main these. things that you say for these just these three games, it just seems like from UConn they've bumped up from seven to eight point wins just to get in over over ten. Yes, and then uh, so in the final four for that Florida uh, 07 Florida team, you got 76 to 66 uh, against UCLA, and then for the national championship against Ohio State, uh, they end up winning. 84 to 75 so a very good run as well uh and i i don't know why i didn't think to pull up the uh let's see it would have been 06 florida tournament schedule as well to see what they did there but uh still i mean that that florida team was special they were extremely good but to me i i just i don't know because you have two straight seasons this is what i'm this is what i'm getting at is that two straight tournaments Winning by double digits, fifteen or more in in last year's tournament. The least they they won by this year in the entire tournament was fourteen or more. That that's 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 the winner to me. That's the winner. If you don't call that a winner, I don't know what I don't know what to call you a loser or someone who just doesn't get the get the message or the, or the memo. I, I can I can understand that the, the uh, maybe the argument that. The 07 Florida team versus this this team, the, the two year teams, so 06, 07, and then this 23, 24 team. Uh, if you want to compare them and say that they're both equal, they're right up there for the top. I can I can take that argument. I think this UConn team is the best, and it's probably just because it's the most recent on my mind. Uh, I'll be mm-hmm. I'll be totally honest that that might be biased to recency. Um, yeah, or, you know, to to look at the, what's what's recently put out there, um, but. Going on, still in college basketball, we had some big news. Uh, of course, backing up a little while back, we, we heard that that uh, Coach Musselman left Arkansas, but now we've got Coach John Calipari uh, leaving Kentucky for Arkansas. And, and, and this is the thing, too, is that it sounds like he's getting paid slightly less than the $8.5 million he was getting at Kentucky to go and leave for a school that's really not a blue blood. Uh, and so th- this was kind of a move that kind of caught some people by surprise um, from sources that I've heard. It sounds like the writing was on the wall that maybe it was time for him to leave and that he was going to leave one way or another. So it was probably best for him to leave on good terms and find himself another job. Uh, and that makes the most sense. That's the only way I can make sense of leaving a place like Kentucky and what you've built up there. Um, but now coming coming in and, and to to where you're at now going to Arkansas who they've had a, a you know if you back up to last season a good little run in the tournament this year mm-hmm. not really much I don't think they made the tournament at a tournament at all um and so you you see what what they were able to do this year then in recent recent times we we've seen Arkansas be decent at basketball we've never seen them be dominant um, but then you bring in a guy like Coach Calipari. Uh, first off, do you, do you think do you think that this this is a good move for Arkansas to get Coach Coach Calipari? I mean, with what Coach Calipari and his reputation have done, there's a part of me that wants to say yes, and there's a part of me that wants to say no. The reason why I say yes is just because you can get a new person in there that can understand different little capabilities for a team that you can see that. You just mentioned they're they're a strong team, but they're not a dominant knock your socks off team. Now, the part of me that says no about this situation is I understand going to a new facility. You would think that they would offer a good chunk of change for you to come to said school and you take it for a little bit less. I mean, I know obviously for a lot of people, well, I shouldn't say a lot of people, but in this kind of standpoint, for looking at a coach's standpoint, 
money doesn't matter. It's just how you get the players to play and if they can make it to the league. And they want to see those those players that they're coaching and make them shine and get them to the league. But I understand the money situation, but looking at who he's going to, it's going to be a, I wouldn't say rough, but it's going to be a tough hill coming from your previous school now to Arkansas. You have got a whole different animal coming from Kentucky, correct, Josh? Yeah. I mean, yeah, coming from Kentucky over coming Arkansas. Coming from Kentucky to Arkansas. Yeah. I mean, you look at what Kentucky did this this March Madness. They completely got knocked out first round by. Um, oh, I'm drawing a blank on it. Um, uh, with, it was first round you, against uh, Oakland. Oakland, yeah, because of um, Jake Oakey. Well, and, so yeah, yeah. I mean, if we if we go back in the last few years, and and this is the yeah. big reason why I think the writing was on the wall. Um, so starting off this year, like you said, first round uh, in, in the round of, of 64, uh, mm-hmm. you lose 76 to 80 against a, a 14 seed Oakland. Um, when you're what, like a four seed? They're a three seed. Three, three seed losing to a, four, a 14 seed. Uh, and then, you know, you go back to last year. Uh, they, were, they were a six seed in the East region. Uh, and they, they win first round to Providence and then they lose uh, to Kansas State. Uh, you know, a not not a big deal there. I mean, you lost to a good team last year in K-State who made a good run. Um, but did. then the, the year before that uh, was a really big one whenever you were two seed and lost to a 15 seed St. Peter's. Uh, and then going back, uh, you know, and, and the, the year before that, uh, in, in the 18-19 season, uh, you know, you, you, you win uh, three games and then lose one in, in the regional final. I mean, so... You know, you, you made it to the Sweet 16 in the last last four years. That was the best you, you, you've made. I mean, that's that's not what we're used to when you talk about what they were able to do with, uh, you know, with uh, Anthony Davis. And I think that's the most recent, the most recent big-time success that they've had. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so, you know, you go back to like the 13-14 season when they had a good run making it to the national championship. Uh, or I think they were even in the national championship the year before that, uh, CD would have been 2012, 2012. I think. Yes. Um, so, you know, and, and I mean, you, you, you look at what they've done historically and specifically here in the last, you know, 15 years. Uh, you know, Coach K, or sorry, not Coach K, Coach Calipari, uh, he, he's, he's been no known for bringing in this great talent you think of guys like john wall and anthony davis Uh, i mean the list list goes on with with these kentucky players that he used to bring in but adjusting to the game this isn't a game where you can bring these one and done guys back into the game and then expect to go win because you've got freshmen who get to a, a game you know the tournament against oakland and they lose because they make freshman mistakes that's expected from a freshman to make those rookie mistakes your first year on the big stage. So, you know, that, I think that's the big thing that was just kind of doing it doing it in for him. Uh, and, and I do think the writing was on the wall. I think that's why he had to have to have taken taken this job. And, and uh, you know, it just makes sense. So uh, we'll have to stay tuned into and, and looking at, at who accepts that Kentucky job because that's a big one. A lot of talks about how they've been going after Hurley, trying to get him to come from UConn over and – I've seen sources saying that they've offered him up to eleven point some million dollars. Wow, that's that's a big, hefty paycheck. More or less in discussions, but no official offers made, from what I know. Uh, right. So we'll definitely we'll definitely stay tuned uh, on, on that job opening there. I think that's probably the biggest one open in, in college basketball right now. One of the biggest openings that you could have just opened up. Uh, I, I don't think Hurley's going anywhere. I think he enjoys where he's at, building the dynasty there at UConn. And I know his his end goal. I think he wants to make it to the NBA. I just don't know how well he's going to make it in the NBA because he's a great coach for college because you can but yell at your, your, your guys in the NBA. huddle. You, you yeah. can't do that in the NBA. You don't have as much control over your guys in the NBA. Uh, I'd like so to see I, him step up against like KD or Anthony Edwards and just, or even Cat, and just get it in his face and let's see what the Cat can claw back to. Well, and like you know, if if he were to go over to the Knicks uh, and 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 start off over there, what whatever talent he brings in, it's it's different there. Those are grown men who are professionals at what they do. That they, they don't listen to their coach yelling at them. 
You know, it's yeah. it's more, hey guys, you're doing great. We can we can adjust here and there. Not watch not here, the way that he there, coaches. You know, did did you see the play uh, on Monday night whenever he he ran out <laughs> and like I don't hey, know he if pushed he, him. He, he lost it. He like thought he was in yeah. practice or something and pushes his guy forward. You can't do that, coach. You yeah. got to step on. I'm not sure how he didn't get a tech for that. Um, <laughs> That's what I was wondering. I'm like, how do you not get a technical for that? Yeah, but a, a, a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of news there with with the Kentucky job opening. It sounds like they have their guy. We'll keep our ears open to see if they end up yeah. making the hire. But let's jump over to the UFL. Uh, a video. Uh, I, I meant to have a video ready to to show, but if you guys paid any attention, if you've seen any kind of highlights of the UFL, this is probably one of the highlights from this last week of them playing, uh, and it was a, a kickoff. The returner is, is making a big return, ends up getting along the sidelines, uh, and a, a player by the name of Donald De La Hay, who is also known as Destroying, if you've seen his videos on YouTube, you know exactly who I'm talking about, plays for the San Antonio Brahmas, uh, a ph- phenomenal athlete. He's got a leg. Uh, he, he's quick. He, he, can, he, he can do a lot out on the field. Uh, we, we saw... Him, they them kind of attempt that fake punt didn't end up mm-hmm. going towards him, but I think that was kind of the plan. Like, hey, you're you're kind of a sneaky good athlete. Let's line you up for a punt and then transition you outside where we pass it to you. I think that was the game plan. Um, but he's he's a tremendous athlete, uh, and he ended up going down and and making a big time tackle, a big hit. But the bad. way that he hit uh, was obviously not well. And I I I think I, I put something out on social media where I kind of shared the. The clip of that, and it said, "Get you a get you a, a kicker that kick knows it. knows how to hit or that wants to hit." Uh, and, and I said, "Yeah." And the thing that they didn't mention is that when he made that big hit, he ended up fracturing his neck. So get yourself a kicker who knows how to tackle rather than just wanting to make the tackle. Um, yeah. But terrible news for him. I mean, he's if you, if you've seen his his videos, he's a a really fun guy to watch. Uh, I, I I enjoy I enjoy watching his videos because he's he's competitive. Uh, he wants to get to the NFL. He left U- UCF as a kicker on a scholarship to do his YouTube channel because they told him he can't do that and be monetized. Uh, and so he said, okay, well, then I'm, I'm just going to go off and do that because I've got a lot of potential there. He's built something great, a great brand in that. Uh, but now, you know, making it to the UFL, second game in, if I'm if I'm thinking correctly, and a season-ending injury. I, I hate to see it for him, man. Yeah, it's definitely an unfortunate turn of events because I follow him on all of his social medias and just looking at what he's done and having a career where you're in college and like you mentioned, getting getting told that you can't do this because due to monetization and going off and doing your thing and now coming back into into competitive football and this isn't the way <clears throat> you want to see any kind of player start a year off with a season ending entry, especially with something like this. Of course, from all of us at Rise and Occasion Office, our thoughts and prayers for a healthy and speedy recovery. And this definitely is one of those things to where you look at a lot of these fan bases and everyone every person every team I should say excuse me every team has that one person everyone loves to follow on whether it be social media or just in general and just listen to their story and he definitely has one of those stories to where it's it's kind of touching for a heart just especially from what he grew up from and how he was transitioning from college to now the UFL and it's definitely one of those moments to where you wish it wouldn't have happened, but unfortunately it is what it is. And we can just wish him nothing but smooth sailing and recovery from here on out, of course. And I know he's going to be obviously in good hands. You get into these kind of positions to where you get these people, this is what they're really trained to do. They're, they're trained to make these people healthier and better than sometimes even stronger than what they were before. And it's, it's just, a horrific event when i first saw the hit to me it didn't look necessarily bad well, i he, mean he got he, up too i think i, I think i well, heard that's what got, heard him that's what got me back kind of, and it, forth yeah um, and that, yeah by first first glance that's that's awesome i, I mean yeah. you think back like pat mcafee is the guy that oh, kind of made man, kickers cool yeah. you know, he's he's the guy that made kickers cool Let's and go back to watching denver yeah, and so uh, you know, seeing seeing the kicker come up and make a big hit, you love to see it. But 
you could tell by the way he ducked his head, not not the way you want to make a tackle, especially on a guy that's running full force towards you. Uh, you've you've got to make a, a smarter play. I know everyone wants to make that big hit. Um, I, I'm not I'm not criticizing him at all. He's a, he's a phenomenal no, no, no. athlete. Uh, I, I love I love what he's done with his brand too. Seeing what yeah. he, he's able to do, uh, and then his journey into the NFL. He's trying to make the into the NFL something that he feels like he kind of got robbed of because of the rules that have now been changed where, man, that kind of ticks you off looking back that now, if you were to start today, you could still have your monetized YouTube channel. Um, mm-hmm. But just because you were in the wrong wrong era, uh, you're not allowed to. So, yeah, Josh, uh, prayers I wanna, for, for speedy co- recovery for sure. I want to throw this out there. I know, obviously, with the NFL approving this new kickoff rule, just like what we're seeing here. And, um, well, this, I know, this isn't the same kickoff now, though. <laughs> oh, it's not? No, yeah. so that's that was what I had a, a beef with the XFL. The XFL started this new kickoff rule, and then now that they merged with the USFL, this UFL, they have a more aggressive kickoff than they than the the regular NFL kickoff. And well, that's so now, was- yeah. So this this isn't the same uh, kickoff at all. And yeah, uh, if, if it if it is, maybe I'm mistaken. Um, but if you look back at last year in the XFL, that's the kickoff. If if I'm understanding it correctly, that's the kickoff uh, that that will be enforced uh, this okay. upcoming season. So definitely okay. different, but injuries like this may may kind of prove a little bit more of the NFL's point and and trying to say, see, we don't want returners. I get where they're coming from for player safety. I want player safety too, but train the players on on how to tackle better. Train them uh, and 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 keep on improving the equipment. Keep on working on that kind of stuff not taking aspects out of the game like that. Uh, yeah. Just too And far. that's what I was even going to say. That's why I was going to even ask you, like, what do you think of the the situation and now them changing it? Do you think we're going to expect more injuries or do you think it's going to be kind of neutral, less? Or But obviously you just kind of answer your own que- my question, but go ahead. Uh, change, ch- change all the stadiums away from that artificial turf. If you want to cut down injuries, Amen. if you want to cut down injuries for real and you're really serious about it, you're going to spend whatever money you got to do to do that. That's that's my big thing. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah I just I, I can't stand the whole player safety, but let's add some games. Mm. That that doesn't make any sense to me. You're not looking out for player safety. Uh, no, you're, you're, you're I, I don't know what your tactic is, honestly. I think you're just trying to put up a front and act like you're worried about the player safety, but you're not mm-hmm. really. But right. let's jump over to the NFL now that we're talking about football. Uh, and we've got an opening weekend game between the Packers and Eagles. I don't think we've mentioned this on the show yet. It's been known that the Eagles were going to have their opening game in Brazil. Uh, I don't think I had seen who it was going to be against until here recently, uh, last day or two. Um, but it's going to be the, the Eagles against the Packers opener in Brazil, but it's on a Friday, September 5th, on opening weekend. So Oklahoma, uh, uh, here, in, uh, what was it, yesterday or the day before, they announced that they're moving their opener date back to Friday um, because it was going to be on Saturday around 2.30, I think was the the, uh, scheduled time. Um, And because of the last few years, it's been so hot in Norman on opening day that they wanted to move it back to a night night game when it wasn't so hot. So they moved it back to a Friday. Uh, Mm -hmm. Now the NFL doing this too, where the Packers-Eagles opening on a Friday. I... I love the fact that they're doing this in Brazil. I'm excited for that aspect. And I want to talk about that. But first, I want to talk about doing it on a Friday. There's a lot of states and a lot of areas where where high school football is very big. You're taking some something away from high school football uh, or, you know, vice versa. I mean, you, you are for Eagles fans who have a have a son or a nephew that they want to go watch or maybe just a local high school that they want to go support they're going to have to make the decision to not be able to see the game that they want to watch on TV because they're going to go support their their nephew or whatever, you know, go support the local school, uh, or they're going to skip going to support the local school because the NFL is playing on TV. I I just don't like we, – we have our set days. We have high school Friday night lights. We have Saturday for, for college football, and then we have Sundays for, for the NFL. You're allowed to play on Sundays in college football when the NFL is not going on. It's it's another scheduling issue, like like we talked about with the men's and men's basketball tournament, or even the the, co- the uh, college football national championship. Figure out your scheduling priorities and and get it straight because I I don't like them playing it on a Friday, but going to the Brazil, 
I, I love this. I think this is going to be exciting. I love whenever they do the international games. Now they're doing it in an international game in Brazil. I think th this the atmosphere is going to be electric for sure. Absolutely. I mean, you look at any of these international games, and it always just seems to bring the hype, especially earlier during college football this last season when Notre Dame got to go play in fighting Irish country over there. That was what got me really going. Like, you've obviously – I know that's even in college, but I know for NFL-wise playing over in Germany, then um, I know there was a couple other games that got played overseas as well. But, I mean, you add – Brazil. <coughs> Excuse me. I know looking for like the country of Brazil, this is definitely a situation where they're just everyone's used to them for being for soccer or as a lot of people say football. And football. if if I didn't if I didn't say that, I probably there's two individuals I work with they would be really really upset with me. Um they this is definitely something to where it's really really cool and of course looking at a player standpoint, I'm going to Brazil to play football. This is amazing. I mean, this is definitely going to be one of those moments to where, like you always say, you know, like a national championship aspect or any kind of championship aspect, take it for granted. Don't take it for granted. Leave it on the field and just make the memories and make the most of it. This is definitely one of those situations to where I think it's going to be really, really exciting. I I know it's in Brazil. I don't know exactly where at in Brazil is played. Do you by any chance know Josh or no, not, not entirely sure. I, I, entirely I did. Sure. Um, I can, I can pull it up here. I didn't know if it was in like Rio or, um, I would assume so. Somewhere. That's what, that was my um, common assumption that it was in Rio, but I mean, no matter where it's going to be at. So in it's, Brazil, it's Corinthians arena. Okay. Uh, in, is that St. Pablo? St. Pablo. Yeah, yeah St. Pablo. St. Pablo, Brazil. And um, yeah, St. Yeah, St. Pablo. I couldn't remember can, exactly where it was. I, I saw the Corinthians arena. Yeah, this is definitely going to be one of those moments, like I said, make the most of it and go out there and enjoy it just because think of every person that has wanted to be in this type of a situation and go overseas and play somewhere outside of the U.S. and – get to have this moment in your career. I mean, how many players can truly say, I went to Brazil to play American football? Yeah, I mean, and, and we, we saw them in the last few years going over to London. I think those are cool games. And like you brought up, going over to Ireland, we had Nebraska versus Northwestern a couple of years ago. And then we had, uh, yeah, it was it was Notre Dame. Who did they play? Notre Dame against? Um, was it was USC? What was it? Was it USC? With Caleb no, it wasn't Williams? USC. No. Um, um, I don't know why I'm drawing a blank on who that was. It was a smaller school. Was it Navy? Yeah, I think, yeah, it, Navy. I think it might have been Navy. Yeah, yeah it was Navy. Uh, yeah. Pretty sure I'm right on that. But yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. And, and Ireland brought the energy. Ireland brought oh, the energy 100%. for sure. London you brings a, a different energy than Ireland. Still some energy. Brazil? This is going to be man. up there. It's going to be up there with Ireland. It's going to be up there with Ireland. I think that's going to be a very fun one. It's, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm excited for it. I think that's going to be a lot of fun. But like yeah. I said, I just don't want you taking it away from, from high school football. That's, that's my only thing. Uh, yeah. And so, but ultimately, I'm going to be happy that football is on TV. I'm not going to complain. Amen. But jumping over, we've got some news uh, where the NAIA, it's a, a smaller, you know, kind of a, uh, smaller kind of like d2 you know kind of kind of how there's d different divisions a division if you're not familiar with it uh, they've announced a policy banning transgender uh, you know tr whatever they're called but basically transgender banning men from playing in women's sports uh, all that i have to say on this is it's a crazy world that we live in to have to say that sentence that men are not allowed to play in women's sports especially after we've had title nine where we fought for women's sports. Uh, Don Staley making a statement on this, where if you're worried about hurting someone's feelings on either side, just decline to answer the, the question. I, I would have understood that uh, from Don Staley, but uh, you know, we, we look over a couple of years ago, Leah Thomas, um, you know, and, and how much he, he stole from, uh, from uh, what, what's her name now? Riley Gaines. Riley Gaines. Uh, yeah. And, and, and so many other, other girls in the sport, uh, you know, there's there's so much about this is, that's so wrong. It's just a screwed up world that we live in. That this is this has to be a policy to ban men from playing in women's sports. 
It truly baffles me just because at this day and age for what we have to witness for um, for specific people being banned from playing a sport and I'm I'm sick and tired of it. I'm 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 going to be honest with you. I'm fed up with it. I mean, I'm not the one to usually be on the criticism criticism side of things, but I just want to go to where I can watch a sport and if you get into this position to where you're you're afraid like you just obviously mentioned, it's a really good point. If you're afraid of hurting somebody on your team or hurting somebody on the opponent's team. I'm sorry. You shouldn't be playing. I mean, if you have to be comfortable to where you can, you know, you're going to withstand criticism and you're going to withstand a lot of it. Well, and and a lot of people take this issue and act as if we're saying that just because You've gone through whatever whatever you want to go through in life, uh, wh- whatever decisions you make that we're saying you can't play sports. No, you can play sports, but there's a reason why we have two divisions of sports. We have mm-hmm. men's sports and women's sports. sports. We have co-ed sports and certain sports, but there's a reason why we've divided most sports. When we talk about higher, higher level sports like collegiate, collegiate level and pro level, we've divided them into men's and women's. Uh, we were mm-hmm. just talking about this a minute ago about, uh, you know, women's, women's basketball has a smaller basketball three point line in closer. Uh, and like I said, I'm a proponent of lowering the, lowering the foot, the, the hoop down a foot, uh, do something to, to make it more exciting, make it easier for them to do things like the dunks and the breakaway uh, you know, breakaway shots and everything, the kind of the, the breakaway scoring, all that kind of stuff. Just there's so much more that can that could happen if we made that more accessible. But there's a reason why we have these differences in sports. There's a reason why we have a division in sports. We're keeping them separated for for a simple reason. And like the the, the biggest thing, like I said, is just how crazy it is that this is first of all that this is news. Uh, second off, that we have to make a policy that says men can't compete in women's sports. <laughs> mm-hmm. I. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, like I said, I'm a short for words of this entire situation. It just completely mind boggles me that we have to, we have to endure this kind of situation. But at the end of the day, I'm still going to be me. I, I understand with what you have gone through in life and I will fully support you with your, your decisions and, that if that's what you want to do, okay, I will support you. I will I will stand up with you. But at the end of the day, if you're gonna bash and criticize about not liking the way that certain things are, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you an earful. But that's besides the point, Josh. I mean, I I can keep going on, but you can probably get the picture. Yeah, yeah. It's just uh, Congrats to, to the NAIA for making this this decision. This is the correct decision, um, obviously. I mean, it, it's it's crazy that we have to make these rules, but I'm glad that they made it because that's where we're going. Uh, mm-hmm. is if you don't make it, it's going to be an unprecedented uh, you know situation where we have another Leah Thomas whooping competition and stealing trophies from from women. Um, and that's that's something that you know we can we can sit here and debate on. Uh, if if you don't like my stance on it, you don't like our stance on it. Feel free to reach out. Maybe we can have you on the show for for a debate on this topic. Um, it's it's one that I'm, I'm I'll stand on uh, with with Riley Gaines. Uh, if you don't know who Riley Gaines is, uh, look up her with Joe Rogan. Her her interview with Joe Rogan, uh, an, an amazing story, and it, it just goes to show what truly goes on behind the scenes. Uh, you know, it, with with men trying to compete in women's sports. But that's pretty much all we've got for today, guys. Uh, we've got a lot more to give to you guys. Make sure to stay tuned because we're going to be talking about UFC 300 coming up. That's going to be exciting. That's a big fight night coming up this weekend. What, you want to tune in because we are going to be recapping that one. We're also going to have to talk about the Frozen Four. It is finally among us, and uh, we're going to get to it. So we've got a couple of more episodes to shoot out this week. That's right. We're giving you extra content. You can't complain with that. We've got it all coming to you guys this week. Very excited for all of that, so stay tuned. Like I said, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure to hit that subscribe button. Uh, That helps us out a lot, and you can hit that like button and comment down below as well. Uh, Follow us over on social media. We've got 
X, formerly known as Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all that fun stuff. Go show us some love. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts, give us a five-star review. It's the best way to help us on those platforms. We thank you all so much for all of the love, all of the support. We'll catch you next time.